Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is our very first lecture of our Bite Size Animal Law series. Um, this is um, our first webinar series and it is a basic introduction to animal law. So we have eight lectures that will span over the next um, eight weeks every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, so after this evening's lecture, we will send you um, another Eventbrite so that you can sign up for next week's lecture. So tonight we're kicking off this series with um, a brief discussion on the history of animal law with Dr. Simon Bruman. So thank you so much, Simon, for um, being here with us this evening and for talking about this really important topic. It's a pleasure. <laughs> um, before I hand it over to Simon, um, I'm just going to cover a few little housekeeping bits. Um, so basically, um, we've, we've offered you a Q&A at the end. Um, and as you can see, for those of you who probably aren't so familiar with Zoom, we're in um, webinar mode. So you can't see other attendees. Um, and actually, we can't see the attendees as well. We can just see your names and the number of attendees. So if you do want to have a question answered throughout the series, um, if you can see down below, there's a little icon with a Q&A on it with a little speech balloon. Pop your question into there throughout the series, or sorry, throughout the lecture, um, and at the end, we can answer them for you. If you do want to remain anonymous, um, make sure you, you select submit anonymous questions so we can't see your name attached to your question. Um, and we've done it this way. We've, we, you're able to see other people's questions. Um, in the event that you see a question you may want to ask, you can just vote it up. So at the end, Simon and I will see um, there may be some questions that are more popular that we can answer first. Um, as well, it, it may be the case that we um, were not able to get through all the questions. So um, if that does happen, I'm going to pop um, into the chat box here. One second, all panelists and attendees, I'll pop in our student group email. So if you did ask a question and you didn't get it answered, send it along and we'll try to answer it for you. Um, there you go, great, okay. Again, if you wanna ask a question and be anonymous, submit anonymous question, okay? Right, okay, so um, at this point you will have probably read the Eventbrite and you will have already read all about Simon. Um, so, and likely that's why you're here to hear from Simon and not me. So I'll try and wrap this up really quickly. I just want to give Simon an introduction. Um, so Simon is a fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics and he is a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. And Simon is a Steve Award winner for 2020 from the International Society of Animal Rights for his contribution to developing animal law in higher education. Simon has been teaching animal law for 26 years. Right? Yes, and um, he teaches at John, Liverpool John Moores. Simon's animal law module has become a fan favorite amongst the undergraduate law student. That's fantastic. Um, and there has even been a few transitions into veganism and vegetarianism post lectures. This is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Simon is widely published and he co-wrote the book Law Relating to Animals. So let's give Simon a warm silent welcome. We can't hear you. <laughs> um, Simon, if you'd like to say a few words before I explain how tonight's lecture will work. Okay, well, well, thank you, uh, Tiffany. I notice it has your name as Paula Sparks. We have two Paula Sparks there, but you are actually <laughs> Tiffany. I know that. Um, uh, just thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks to to you and to Paula for arranging all this, and um, and also for all of you out there, all two hundred eight of you, it seems now. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we'll we'll get going soon. Excellent. So we have decided this evening to do it Q and A style. So I have fifteen questions for Simon. Um, and as he answers them, it's going to walk us through the history of animal law. Okay, so we'll get started. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the first question for you, Simon. Why did you decide to start a course in animal law? Well, I think um, the, the, the reason for that were partly because uh, Debbie and I, I mean, I can't take the whole, uh, the, uh, the the plaudits for starting the course originally in 1994 when we started at, at John Moore's um Debbie Legg who are we're now back together again in terms of uh, writing again which is great 
um, we decided there was a, a hole in the market. We thought we, we both were believers, um, both vegetarian at the time. I think Debbie may have been vegan then. Mm-hmm. And we decided it was because of our um, commitments. Uh, we'd both been involved in animal rights, as we then termed it. We'll come to that later. Um, and we, we thought, well, this is something that law students should do. So um, we, it was much easier then to start a, a course like this in, in uh, higher education. So we met in a park. It was a sunny day, a bit like we're getting at the moment out there in pandemic land. And uh, we sat down and said, well, what would we want to do with, um, with law students? How would we do it? And uh, then literally the next September, we were up and running and we had um, a large number of students right from, from the get go. I think there was 100 did it the first, first year. So that, that, that was the main reason. Excellent. And how many did you have this past year? 75 this past year. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure how many for the, for the upcoming year, but it's the 75. It's a lot of marking, but um, yes. yes and, and I've heard probably about eight or nine said they turned vegan or vegetarian this year. Excellent. Which is good. <laughs> Great. Okay. Question number two. Why mm. is it important to look at the history of animal law? And number two, part two B, why did you as a legal educator decide to look into the history of animal law? Okay, well, that, that, was, that was something which um, came as a surprise to me as much as anybody else, really. I, 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 we were look, the, the original intention was to look at um, areas of animal law that were you know, obviously really important, like whaling and agriculture, experimentation. But as we um, looked at it, and particularly as we decided to write a book about it, which is um, you know well out of date, but there it is. You know, it's it it became the um, the, the the book for the course. Um, we looked at how everything had come about and how we were in the situation we in we were in, and the, the real thing that came through was how do we have so many bad laws in relation to animals? Mm-hmm. Practically everything, even though you can see developments, everything seemed to be. Um, out of kilter with scientific and philosophical reality as far as I could see. So when, the, when we came to write the book, um, the idea was that um, um, I would write a, an introductory chapter for, for law students or whomsoever. I mean, it was probably aimed at the general public as well, just to say, um, this is where the law comes from. This is, um, this is why um, we have what we have now. Uh, and and another reason for it was to, to 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 say, well, the laws as we have them now aren't necessarily good for now. They, a lot of them are based on historical development and historical attitudes to, to animals. And a lot of them are ba- based in religious belief mm-hmm. um, from 200 years ago, from 2000 years ago, which was a surprise. So I think it was really important. It's remained important to me, me as a, a scholar of um, uh, animal or possibly the most important thing to to look at law and say well it's not necessarily important um to to leave it as as it is now because this may reflect uh, a, a reality of times gone past so i think that's why it's important just to be able to say well you know this isn't a reality that we need to accept mm-hmm. it may be based on thinking which is now faulty and out of date absolutely Thank you. And can you give us a couple examples of how the history of animal law resonates today? Well, I can actually. I can give give one example that resonates from last Friday, um, which is which is a uh, quite interesting. There's a couple. Uh, this is quite hard to narrow down because I think there's a lot of um, of the, the 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 historical animal law which resonates today. But this is a really good example. It was sent to me by a colleague. Actually, I hadn't spotted it, and it's a case that's. Um, Boric, I think that's Boric in, up in the northwest and Clearwater. It was, it was a, it was um, about fish. It's a fish case, but it's um, it's really interesting because the 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 what happened was in 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 cutting a very long story short, what happened? There was a uh, a fish farm and they collapsed and they had they were taken over back, back by the bank and sold to somebody else. But what they claimed was that the fish had not actually gone as part of this deal that they still retained rights to the fish um which is quite interesting because there's a there's a line which uh between animal uh, animals in captivity and those who are taken from um sorry from the wild into captivity there's a difference wild animals and captive wild animals and it was really difficult with these supposedly wild animals that's the way fish are defined <clears throat> excuse me um, as to whether they were still wild animals because they'd never been in the wild as such they'd just been in these pools anyway uh, 
the judge looked at it and to do so to they, they went all the way back to the roman law they looked at the, in this judgment that i've been reading this week they go back to gaius in the second century and justinian one of the last roman emperors who wrote down all the 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 laws a lot of which have fed through to now to try and define what captive fish fish were they lost just by the way the 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 transfer of the fish was complete no, which which is quite interesting. But to do so, they'd actually gone back to Roman law. And the second example I've always think is really interesting, and it's in the um, in the book I, I I found it when I was doing the research for those chapters, which got out of control. I, I was supposed to be a little introduction; it ended up being 120 pages of introduction. But I uh, came across um, what happened in Stamford in in the 1830s when the the second version of the uh, of uk legislation stopping bull baiting had uh, come into into play and there was a, the town of stamford it's in lincolnshire they were particularly vociferous in in refusing to um to back down on bull baiting and this was pretty nasty practice you know they used to set dogs on the on the unfortunate beast and you know it, it even it, even worse and stab it and prod it you know the tales are pretty harrowing um and they wouldn't give it up they wouldn't give up the practice um apart from the fact that it's um one year they sent in a, the, in 1836 after the act that a, a spy was sent in to monitor what was going on 1837 they sent in 200 police constables to try and stop it happening at the, the summer fair and then the following year because it's that they still managed to release a bull into the streets uh, in 1837 in 38 1838 they um they sent in the dragoon guards and made the mayor pay for it um so because it, it became financial, that, that, that sort of put the, the cap on it and the whole town got behind stopping it. But they you know, really put up a, a fight. Now, when I looked at that, I, I thought, because it was, it was a, a kind of custom, they've been doing this for four to 600 years. There's a lots, of, lots of things you can say about hunting, which seems to be quite resonant with that. You've got a, a, a community that's been doing this for a long time, really don't want to give it up and really uh, you know, have put up a fight since the Hunting Act to try and keep things going. And there's all sorts of uh, dubious practices going on in hunting. And I thought, well, it's, you know, very similar. When you look at the two, you've got two um, entrenched communities who really don't want to give up ancient practices. So that's the second one. There's plenty of others, but uh, I would be here all night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Who were the first people to legislate in favor of animal welfare? Right. Okay. Um, well, that is uh, that's there's there's been sort of like a race to the North Pole about that one. You know, who was it? There's a lot of people who claim it, and the the UK's always claimed it be, because of Richard Martin in 1825. But I don't think they were first. <laughs> I I think they the the Puritans of Massachusetts were first, as far as I can see. Um, that's actually in favour of animal welfare because there's uh, um, that you know, it was protective measures, and that was 1671 which is the earliest I've seen. Um, and then, you know, there's not much uh, that, that I've, I've seen in the intervening period until uh, attempts in the UK Parliament, which were very early 1800s, and the first successful one was 1822. Um, so I'd, I'd put it down to the Puritans of Massachusetts in 1671. I think they got there first. They hit the pole. But there's, there's other legislation from the, the ancient Greeks. And, and the, well, that's legislation is the wrong way, law. A way, but it's usually punitive. They used to um, uh, have trials and prosecutions of animals, and you know the beast was sent from beyond these lands. So that wasn't animal welfare at all, but it was law and animals. But it wasn't in their favour at all. So I think people out there may know better. If you've heard of anything, anything different, <laughs> please let me know for edition number two. Um, but I think I think it was the Puritans of Ma Massachusetts. Excellent. Okay. And what would you say were the main stages in the development of worldwide animal law? Okay. Uh, well, looking at the, the, the historical development, I reckon um, there's a lot. There's a lot of stages, but I, I identified four, really, that seem to be quite important. The, the Greeks, and Plato and Aristotle, and uh, not really doing it for law and for animals' sake, certainly not, but they were, they were doing it to define the development of society so they were saying we need society we talk we're rational and to explain what human beings were they they compared with the animals so so 
that they were important and and because they rubbed alongside the romans quite a lot um and in uh maybe a bit of that later if we if we can get to it um um they they um they they were important because they influenced i think the romans and the romans began to create laws you know the romans were were the people who really started to document stuff and put it down and create property and you know which which still passes through today and that's another influence of the past on now the romans the romans are everywhere and um and still still there so i'd say the greeks the romans certainly then there's a big gap the dark ages you get you get through um early 12th 13th centuries a little bit said in 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 a ecclesiastical work around about that time but i think it's the reformation is next because the reformation 17th century the enlightenment um was good and bad for animals it it it, um it started off people thinking and there's some fantastic writing i i i was blown away by it when i was doing the book just how much of uh, of the writing of people like david hume and and uh, uh hobbs and Locke was really really fantastic um and really enlightening you know we we'd recognize what they're saying today so they were writing about enlightenment towards of the attitude towards animals whilst all these her- horrendous things and horrors were going on at the same time because science was developing and uh, that's the birth of experimentation in people's front rooms and um, um, if we've got time later on uh, there's, there's this artwork around that which uh, which uh, shows shows this happening so I think the Reformation was the next next important step because that then led snowballed all the way through to the other important uh time period i i i think which is around about the beginning of the 19th century because that's when um we have, have industrial scientific experimentation we've got really big units of agriculture going and there was a lot of concern and we'd also at that point got the the uh, the towns and cities were hitting upon um the dubious practices and uh, women were heavily involved in this because i know it, london london took in smithfield market was known as in a terrible place it was really appalling and uh women who are now at free time because uh that they were they were staying at home and wandering the streets in groups and things were actually coming across you know these horrendous practices and it was them who, who drove the formation of the rspca for example so i think those four periods for me the greeks the romans reformation and early 19th century probably the big four um and now there's probably five now i think um with international law i think international law's you know really big area burgeoning area which um has uh, has become the fifth but didn't write about that because it hadn't really taken off in 90 in the 90s when we were writing well, thank you okay next question okay did the romans live up to their brutal image in the amphitheaters regarding the treatment of animals yes <laughs> they, 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 they did they, they didn't they didn't they 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 um the, the Colosseums, uh you know obviously well known for that um that five thousand animals slaughtered uh, during the opening ceremony and i think in the next three days there was another nine thousand animals slaughtered in one way or other you know it was brutal times but because of this there, there, there were a lot of thoughtful um contributions which again was a surprise to me from um seneca plutic porphyry and they were, you know, vegetarian. They were, they were much more thoughtful. So through that period, you know, we talk about the Romans. You know, it's a five hundred, six, seven hundred year period. So, so yes, they were brutal. And the the Colosseums living on in bullfighting now were um, were terrible. You know, ter- terrible for animals and all sorts of animals um, and strange, weird, and wonderful combinations of fights. But we have these contributions, which I think fired up a different kind of imagination and view of animals, which um, did live on. People read this, and when the Reformation came around, people were reading that as well. So I'd say yes, but also the the, the birth of a different kind of way of viewing it as well. Okay, thank you. Um, All right. There seems to be a particular problem with defining animals Mm. as property. Mm. How did this come about, and has it always been a problem? It's the Romans again. They were the people who decided, well, we need to transfer. We need to transfer property and have a way of transferring property. But I, I actually think the, the the original idea behind property was not bad, because if you you have people who are going to um, uh, care for animals and look after them, you have to give them some kind of mm-hmm. a reason for doing that. So ownership was initially not a bad idea. Um, because it meant that you know they they had a vested interest in those animals and might look after them because they would go to market etc it's it's 
completely changed now, of course, because ownership has taken to mean abuse, do what you like with animals, and it's really changed around. And that what we have now is a completely different movement and and arguments against property that. Uh, with the idea of environmentalism, sustainability, and looking after animals for themselves and for their own sakes, that even though property may create people who look after them to a certain extent, the actual practices themselves are extremely dubious. So it's turned on its head, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, I've heard stories about the prosecution of rats, sparrows, Mm. and pigs in Europe. Did this really happen? It certainly did. Yes, there there, there are a lot of lot of cases in, in medieval Europe, um, in the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, right through fifteenth, sixteenth centuries. Uh, just to give you three examples. I, th- I think um, the the, the fillet's pig is probably one of the most uh, famous examples. A pig um, had mauled an infant, um, and as a result, they 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 tried the pig, uh, dressed it up in man's clothing to do so. Uh, and then when found guilty, the, the, the pig was given retribution of the same injuries as it, it had caused to the, the child and killed it, you know, so it was maimed on its legs and maimed in its face first and then hung. Um, and that, that's a famous one. And the, 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 probably more famous, was it's famous because it was then depicted on the church in Falaise uh, in um, northern France. Um, and it was there for 400 years until somebody sent in the painters and decorators and forgot to tell them that this was a, a cherished item of the town and somebody whitewashed it. So it was lost. So the, 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 the depictions, you see, you can, if you look it up online, you can get a picture of, you know, what it was happening. And that was you. It was drawn by somebody after that who knew the, 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 the fresco at the time and did as, as much as they could to remember it. So that's the one that, that, that lives with us. There's no other record of it. There's another one. One of yeah, the, the ones I always remember is the uh, is Dresden, which is 1559, um, when uh, the 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 uh, the the church minister was uh, he was disgusted with sparrows because he he said that they were uh, their vexatious chatterings in church and their unspeakable acts of unchastity. So he he had them prosecuted. It didn't work strangely enough um it, it carried on um and another one in autumn in uh, 1522 which was a really big cause celebra that one it became quite a big case because that was a that was a prosecution of rats um who had uh, destroyed barley and they were prosecuted and they were defended by um chazenay who was one of the famous lawyers of the time you know this is a big match to having somebody like chazenay they were told the rats this is were told to appear in court didn't appear. Chazenay said, well, it takes a long time for the word to get round to rats. So, you know, you can't, can't expect this to, to be immediate. You must give them more time. So they gave them more time um, and didn't appear again, strangely enough. And the, Chazenay said, well, um, you know, that this, that this, this still t- needs more time. So you need to get, and he managed to get a stay again. Third time they went back um, again, no rats. And she has, and they said, well, they're, they're, they're ready to come. They've come along now. They're ready, but they're scared of your cats and dogs. And he pointed around the, the courtroom because they all had cats and dogs uh, with them and said, you know, can you expect the rats to turn up here? You know, this is extremely threatening situation for them. So the court agreed, as they naturally would, had another stay of this this case. And um, and then the, the a bit of paperwork got in the way. The 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 um, prosecution forgot to file a bit more pa- paperwork. So... Um, Chazenay won for the rats in default, which was uh, which is incredible. That, I think that's probably my favourite one. But yeah, there's lots of them. Sixty or seventy recorded across Europe. Um, some which may not have had may, people may have heard about the Hartlepool um, orangutan, which we're not quite sure whether that happened or not. But that was later, First World Warish. But we don't think that was it was a uh, supposedly on a beach, and they thought it was a German spy. And it, it, but it's. It, it's vested in mystery that one um so yes they did happen Ooh, okay thank you very much okay animal sorry animal advocates talk about welfare rights and personhood for animals mm. could you say something about how our claims for animals have changed over mm. time yeah I, th- I think um, there has been a big change i think we've um we've we've moved from um the the welfare argument in the early 19th century um and that which led to legislation and experimentation um you've you've got uh, that's 
1909, there was a General Welfare Act for animals. I'm talking about in the UK now. Um, and then you've got 1925 slaughter regulations the first time. So it's all about welfare. It's all about welfare. Then in the 1970s, um, a lot of people writing, philosophers um, uh, started writing a lot about animal rights. This was uh, you know, hot in philosophy departments. And that's where it began. The modern movement began. And that that became about animal rights. The trouble was animal rights um, became an issue because at the same time, running alongside that, you had the growth of human rights. So people were very concerned with human rights post-World War II. It became even bigger. Um, wars were creating problems. Um, so, so the two bumped up against each other and that undermined the welfare movement, I think. Uh, and within the, well, the animal animal advocates movement I, I, I don't know what you call it. we've always called it the animal rights movement and it's difficult to find another term you know welfareists or not there's a people you know really don't like some of these terms so i think um it, it changed at that point in the 70s from being rights and then moving up to probably 2000 i think at, at some point and i'm not quite sure where it happened the idea of rights was sort of like quietly pushed aside it does still come around it quite a bit and now we've got personhood and now we've got person that this has become i think it's basically the same thing that you're asking for for um for uh treatment of animals for for their own sakes which is essentially asking for rights but if you don't call it rights then you are you're not bumping up against wealth human rights you can't have human uh, animals can't have human rights because they can't talk they're not involved in our society they don't have the obligations which is all this kind of technical reasons given by some legal writers it has to be said for why they can't have rights so i think that's why we've now got personhood which um, seems to be the um the cause celebrity in the in the movement now as well as a lot of welfare yeah. issues since bramble 1960s the agricultural uh act for, for animals basically um a lot of countries have got it for the first time so that is you know still very important but the the ultimate aim of a lot of people is personhood and that's how it's changed over time i think um and rights as i say has probably disappeared slightly okay and, and next week actually we're talking about um personhood legal personhood for animals. right okay um okay excellent so mm. next question looking back in history how far do you think we have come and how far do we have to go to provide the best protection for animals? Okay, I, th I think we go to Charles Darwin for this one. Writing in about 1859, he said that for human beings to create a, a moral sense, to develop a fully, fully fully developed moral sense would take about 200 years, which was, you know, kind of a, a reasonable stab now. And I think he's you know, not far off, you know, in terms of uh, we've got about 40 years to get there. So I, I think we've come a long way in terms of the way we look at it. And there's a lot of really good writing. But, you know, we were uh, those strange cases, rats and uh, the pigs and what have you in, in medieval Europe look very odd now. And it's uh, difficult to look at those without any feeling any sort of uh, shame on how a human race could do that. Um, but you look at what we're doing now. You know, we've got absolutely mass industrialization. Um, the coronavirus has created its own problems. We've just leapt into animal testing. And, you know, this seems to have disappeared off anybody's radar. And we know the problems with, with that. Um, so is it, is, it, is it great? No, I don't think it is. Uh, we've got Jap Japan going back to whaling. It's, um, there are a lot of questions to be asked. So, so we, we have come a long way and there's a lot more, lot more people behind this. And, you know, probably the people listening here are some of those, but um, I think, you know, there are, there are challenges and Brexit, you know, I, I wonder what that's going to do and dealing with the USA. So I think we have to be on our guard. Mm -hmm. We definitely have come a long way though, haven't we? But you're right. There's still mm -hmm. a lot of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Your last question. Um, if you had to pick one person from history of animal law to talk to, who would it be? I had trouble with this one. I mean, the idea of sitting at the Parthenon with uh, Aristotle or Plato appealed until I thought, no, you're a redhead. Uh, you know, you're going to get sunburned there. That's, that, that's, a, that's a bad plan. Um, but that, that does does appeal. But uh, I don't think there were great advocates for animals. Jeremy Bentham, I think he'd be an interesting chap to talk to. Um, but the the one that stuck in my mind was was somebody who um, in the in the fifteenth I think fifteenth century Descartes 
I, I think therefore I am man. Um, he was, he came up with something which was terrible for animals. He said, animals don't, uh, don't feel pain. They're just reacting as a, as a, as a leaf blowing in the wind. You know, this is just a automatic response. So if you're experimenting on animals, you've got to do it. You're looking in the eye and you just got to do it. And this led to really appalling abuse. So part of me thinks I'd like to go and have a talk to him, you know, because he caused all sorts of damage for about 200 years, I, I, I think. Um, but there's another chap who, who very interesting, wore very interesting hats, um, who was Lemaitre. He was a Frenchman a bit later, about 150 years later, who, who undermined a bit of what um, Descartes had said and, and un- questioned his philosophies and was taken aback at the reaction. He had to flee France, ended up in the court of Prussia, um, hiding and I always like a good escape story so I'd like to talk it talk to him about his escape and how he got away so probably a few few people a few people not just one yeah. <laughs> okay thank you so much Simon okay um, that is the end of my questions thank you very very much and thank you all so so much and we hope to see you all again here next Wednesday at 7 p.m thank you bye-bye